Good afternoon, dear friends. It is my uh, honorable task today to present our keynote speaker, author, journalist, Hasan Cemal from Turkey. Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to say a few words about my friend, Hrant. He was a turning point in our lives. When I say in our lives, not only in Armenians' lives, but also in Turks' lives. His impact was really felt while he was alive, but after he died, his impact is growing and growing like snowball effect. There is a small but fast increasing segment of population in Turkey who now understands that dialogue between parties is the best way to go, but dialogue is not meaningful if you don't have the facts, if you don't have the truth. And Hrant started to talk about the truth and he was regarded to be a threat to the state. We all think that deep state eliminated him, but in this case it was deep state and the state hand in hand. One planned it and the other covered it up and still covering it up. And hopefully this small but fast growing segment of population in Turkey will prevail and truth will prevail and then justice will prevail. Among the leaders of this small but fast growing segment who is pushing for democratization, human rights, and the truth is author and journalist Hasan Jamal. Mr. Jamal is one of the most renowned and influential journalists and authors in Turkey today. He was born in Istanbul in 1944 and is a graduate of Ankara University from, with a political science degree. He has worked at uh, several leftist papers before he became the uh, editor-in-chief of Jumuriyet newspaper, which was the Kemalist state's official mouthpiece organ. And uh, for a long time, he did, he did go along with the state version of history regarding the past, regarding 1915. Then he, uh, from uh, 1980, um, 1981 to 1992, he was the chief editor of Jumuriyet. Then from 1992 to 1998, he became the editor of Sabah, at the time Turkey's largest circulation paper. Then he moved to Milliet in 1998 until past year 19, uh, 2013. He speaks his mind and uh, he was heavily influenced by Hrant Dink as well as Taner Akcham and he started questioning the state version of history. And he went through a personal transformation intellectually so that from questioning the state version of history, he came to a point where he now acknowledges, recognizes, and apologizes for the Armenian genocide. After Hrant Dink was shot, he went to Armenia, to Yerevan. He visited the Zernagapert uh, genocide monument and he placed flowers there. And this was in 2008. And since then, he has spoken his mind, not only about his personal transformation, but also urging and forcing the state to do what he did, 
which is to acknowledge and to come up, face the truth about 1915. Last year this time, another famous journalist in Turkey passed away, Mehmet Ali Birand. Mehmet Ali Birand and Hasan Cemal were recognized as the two top journalists in Turkey. When Mehmet Ali Birand suddenly passed away, all papers wrote about death of a journalist. When Hasan Cemal was forced to resign from Milliet because he started criticizing the government, people started writing, this is death of journalism in Turkey. Turkey today has the most number of journalists who are in jail, even more than in China or Russia. And Turkey today, for the past few decades, has the most number of journalists who are shot. However, Hasan Cemal is, as I said, a bright light. He courageously writes, not only about the Armenian issue, but also the Kurdish issue. When it was impossible to utter the word Kurd in Turkey because their existence is denied, like Armenians, Killing is denied, and Kurds living is denied in Turkey. Uh, Hasan Cemal wrote about Kurds and visited their leaders in Iraq, Kandil Mountains. So we are honored to have him give us his personal transformation and how he wrote a book called 1915, Ermeni Soykırımı, Armenian Genocide, which is in Turkish, but soon it will be translated to other languages. And Hasan Cemal again courageously and very, uh, in a good gesture, he has decided to donate the distribution rights and all revenues from it to Hrantink Foundation. This book we have here, and now we will hear from Hassan Jamal. It's my distinct pleasure to invite him. Thank you. Now, first of all, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And you have to stand my poor English for some time. And uh, uh, because I will try to do my best uh, with my English. And the, I, I wrote a book. Uh, the name is 1915, Armenian Genocide. And that book published about two years ago in Istanbul, in Turkey. And that book I dedicated to my dear friend, uh, Hrant Dink. And the, I should confess that the grief, the suffering of Rard Dink uh, made me uh, write that book. And in the meantime, not only the pain of uh, grief of Rard Dink, but the pain and the grief of suffering of the uh, Rard Dink's ancestors uh, suffered. Uh, that made me uh, write that book as well. And that is my that was that is my tenth book, and before that I wrote uh, nine books too about the Kurdish problem. Two books I wrote, and the third one is going to appear next week, I think. Uh, again, uh, on the Kurdish problem, but a different one uh, on a. Uh, mountain diaries of a young guerrilla co called Delila. And he, she's a singer in the meantime. And before that, I wrote two books about the military uh, government uh, in Turkey, 12th of September, and so on. Uh, I could tell you that 
uh, Hrant, my dear friend, uh, with his life and death of mine, opened mine uh, hard slog, what I try to call. And now I have been trying to open the hearts and minds of Turks and Armenians to understand each other. I know that is not easy. I know we have been on a long and thin path. But Ranting paid a big ultimate price, what we said. But he speeded up that journey of understanding between Turks and Armenians. As I said, my name is Hasan Cemal, and I was born in Istanbul in 1944. I would like to talk a little bit about my family, family roots. It was a bit complicated. My grandmother is a Georgian origin from the Caucasus, and my uh, grandfather, uh, maternal grandfather, is Circassian from the Grasnodar, from the Northern Caucasus too. My uh, grandfather, Cemal Pasha, born in 1870 in Mithilan Island, Lesbos Island, or Midilli in the Aegean. My uh, grandmother of the paternal one is a, born in Ceres, what we call the Greek Macedonia. And so I was born in Istanbul. The whole family from different roots got together in Istanbul. And a big family. And the, my father was the first, the eldest uh, children of Jamal Pasha, was born in 19. Uh, hundred at the turn of the century in Salonika when his father, my grandfather, was a, a major at the Ottoman army. And the, uh, after the First World War, uh, after the War of Liberation of Turkey, uh, the family of my father uh, came back to Istanbul, and in Istanbul they settled down at a, a big house in a garden in Tatavla, in Kurtuluş, given by Atatürk. And I was having a day lived for some time in that house, in Kurtuluş, in Tatavla, in Istanbul, in that house. And I had a speech like that in New Jersey in last October. Just after the speech, while I was signing the book, a blonde lady, middle ages, near to me and told me that Mr. Jamal, that house given by Atatürk in 1924 to your family, your father's family, belonged to my grandparents. I said, I was surprised a little bit, but I knew that was uh, uh, the Armenian uh, house, and I stand, stood up and shook her hand, and I signed the book, and we looked to each other for a while, and she went away. That is something, the, the, the history and the personal history, history and the relationship, history and with your family. It's a very sensitive issue, and you don't know, and you have to pay attention how to draw a line between them. For instance, in 2008, 2008, for the first time, I went to Yerevan. 
after we lost dear friend, dear friend. And the, I visited the genocide memorial in one morning and they laid down a couple of white coronations for Hrant Dink. And the same day in the afternoon, someone came to me, asked whether I would be, meet someone who was the uh, who is was the member of the gang uh, which assassinated Jamal Pasha in 1922. Uh, one of the members of the uh, gang, his grandson is living in Yerevan. I said, okay, we meet and talk to each other. We met to each other, the grandson of Jamal Pasha and the grandson of the the member of the gang, Armen Gevorkian. We met at the, uh, the place of Republic, just in front of the Marriott Hotel, I think, in Yerevan. We talked to each other, we shook hands, and still we are in contact. And again, history and the pers personal, personal history and what to do. He was of my age and it was very interesting. And, the, and I could give you another uh, example of that history and personal history side. A friend of mine, uh, from my childhood, uh, a very close friend of mine, and we studied uh, at the Faculty of Political Science at the Ankara University, Bahadur Demir. We graduated from the Faculty of Political Science, and he attended the uh, Turkish Foreign Ministry. Uh, he became a diplomat. And he was, uh, he was uh, sent to Los Angeles uh, to the consulate. And before he left uh, Turkey, he came to me and told me, look, I'm going to Los Angeles. I hope nothing would happen to me because of the biggest Armenian diaspora in Los Angeles. And a couple of years, Past, I was working as a young reporter in Ankara. I had the news just from the telex, and the, a young uh, diplomat was killed by an old Armenian in Los Angeles. He was shot dead to death. And now, what to do? I mean, the Armen Gevorkian or Anna of Istanbul, and we are leaving all these things. But the important thing is to learn not to be captive of history, not to be captive of our griefs, but never to forget of course, the griefs and the sufferings of the past, but not to become the captive of the griefs as well. Now, I wrote that, I, I wrote that book because of Rand, because of his grief and sufferings, and now, I want to read a couple of pages from my book, 1915 Armenian Genocide, just to give an example uh, what a Turkish 
writer or journalist or a, a Turk is uh, the transformation uh, and the yeah, I start reading it. One day in Los Angeles, the 21st of March, 2011, in my hotel room, I am working on the speech I'll be making in the evening at Broad Hall of the University of California at Los Angeles. The question is, am I going to pronounce the word genocide in my speech? That is the question on my mind. The opening sentence of my draft speech I have prepared says, I recognize your grief, I understand your grief, and I am here to share your grief. All right, but what grief? That over the genocide or just your grief? Why such evasiveness? Do I know not that the policy of Turkification and Sunnification that aimed to put an end to all diversity and pluralism in Anatolia, whether ethnic, intellectual, or cultural, was started under the Committee of Union of Progress, or Ita Teraki in Turkish. That there was a quest for an Anatolia rid of the internal enemies, do I know that there is continuity between union and progress and the foundation of the Republic? And that from this point of view, 1915 was a historic turning point. Of course I know all about, all the above. Then why such evasiveness? What is my problem with the word genocide? I have learned all these groping over the years, but then why shouldn't you be able to say genocide? To say what you really think. But the evasiveness is still alive. I added the word genocide to that opening sentence of my speech, and then I cross it out and repeat the same round and round again in my hotel room. That was also what happened in Yerevan in September of 2008. Was I going to visit Armenian Genocide Memorial or not? I had finally gone to the memorial, laid five white carnations to the memory of Hranting, had my photo taken and written this for my newspaper, Milliet. But I had not published the photo taken during the visit in September 2008. But that photo now on the cover of my book. In my hotel room in LA, 2011, I was wrestling with one word. Am I going to pronounce the word genocide? I write the word and cross it out again and again. Why? Why am I so concerned about this word? I have visited the genocide memorial. I have signed the petition that apologizes to the Armenians. The title of my column in Milliet on 24th of April 2008-10 was I shared the Armenians' grief over the 24th of April. Moreover, I did think that the 24th of April was a genocide. What the Union and Progress Dictatorship ruling Turkey in 1915 and, and its intelligence entity called Special Organization in Turkish Teşkilat Mahsusa, an entity now considered to have been its deep state, did do Armenians what was planned and deliberate. And I believe that that was constituted a veritable crime against humanity, and that the repatriation of this bloody legacy would, would but bring honor to Turkey. But I evaded the debate on that word, genocide. As dear Ranting said, quote, 
I know what happened to my ancestors. Some of you call this a massacre, some a genocide, some deportation, and some a tragedy. My ancestors call it a slaughter in Anatolian idiom. If a state totally destroys its own citizens, and especially the most vulnerable among them, without regard as to whether they are children, women, or the elderly, from the land where they have grown roots and hurls them on roads uncharted and unfathomable, and that, and if, as a result, all of this, a great, great part of these people vanish, what aspect of humanity would then explain our wrangling or scobling over what words to use to characterize this state of things. If we are going to engage in sophistries of the kind, should we call this geno a genocide or should we call it deportation? If we do not feel so confident as to condemn both with equal measure, what part of the dignity related to our being Human, being human, will be saved by preferring to use deportation rather than genocide, or genocide rather than deportation." Unquote. These words of dear Hrant come to my mind in my hotel room. The wrangling, wrestling over the words, genocide, deportation, tragedy, slaughter, mass slaughter, massacre, carnage, do I agonize in my hotel room in Los Angeles because I have a deep-rooted problem with the word genocide? What is that keeps me from saying and writing frankly what I believe in? Taboos, fears, the pressure of my own community, or Turkish ultra-nationalist known battle cry, you are all Armenians, you are all bastards, article 201, 301, the stigma of treason. Yesterday it was Ali Kemal, today it is Hassan Jamal, the slogan. I have come to this age, 67 then, now 70 this month. And for years I have been defending democracy and freedom of expression, and here I am keeping some of my opinions to myself. Will I still have taboos that, cannot, that I cannot break? Will I not be able to liberate myself from all these, from all these taboos? I said to myself, shame on you, Hassan Jamal. In my hotel room in LA, I finally had the word genocide to that opening sentence of my draft speech. I recognize your grief, I understand your grief, and I am here to share your grief over genocide. I don't forget that evening in Los Angeles, 21st of March, 2011. I was quite excited. Broad Hall of the University at USLA is packed. I take the back door together with two plain clothes officers, Security measures are a bit exaggerated. The question is, what is the grandson of Jamal Pasha going to say? Some apparently grumbled in the lobby. Why we invite the grandson of one of our slaughterers? This won't at all be an easy evening for me. I start out. I look around, all familiar faces, I bring you greetings from Anatolia. Our roots reach into the same land, I said. And I add, I recognize your grief over the Armenian genocide and share it. What I say, uh, these are the couple of pages from my book. And now I will try to say, in Armenian, Parev 
Hargeli Paragamner. I don't know the pronouns in the right way. Now I want to say to you the same in Toronto. I am here, recognize your grief over the genocide, and I share it. And now I want to... Now I want to talk a bit about my, about one of my favorite teams. If you still uh, can stand me, I could continue on that team. The team is that captive minds, free minds, and emancipation of captive minds. And before I start talking on this subject, I want to quote something from the Czech author, Milan Kundera. He said once, the struggle of men against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. And I reiterate, repeat here a sentence that I have often used in my books and articles during the 45 years I have been a journalist. Suffering brings wisdom. Suffering brings wisdom. An issue always knocks on my door, the captive mind and free mind. Indescribable suffering, how minds can be taken captive by totalitarian ideologies and regimes, and how totalitarian states can impose their monolithic truths on people through horrible methods and make them live in a world of lies. I remember it very well. My mind was also a captive mind in 1960s. I didn't know then that this meant living in a world of lies. I thought then I could march on the paths of happiness by simply offering my mind to the command of totalitarian slogans <clears throat> and state cliches. I was a laughing radical. I thought myself a communist. But I didn't know yet that I was at the same time a Kemalist, a Turkish nationalist. I was not aware of the red lines that the Republic of Turkey from its foundation in 1923 on had to trace around our minds. Only years later, was I going to learn that these red lines, stretching back to the young Turk dictatorship of the Triumvirate, Enver, Talat, and Cemal, and also trace the framework of Turkish nationalism all the way up to the present. With the foundation of the Republic, all the Muslims in Anatolia were going to turn into Turks, and non-Muslims would have to hit the road as to make it possible to create a new nation state, a Turkish nation. As a Kurdish intellectual from Hakkari a couple of years ago said, quote, for many years now, the Kurds in Turkey have been trying to prove that they leave Anatolia and the Armenians try to explain that they have died here in Anatolia. There was neither the Kurds nor 1915 in our history, in our official history. That was the kind of history I had learned. That was the kind of history that had taken my mind captive. The Republican state had, on the basis of, on the basis of its official history, made me live in a world of lies. Our history was not a true one, but one that had been invented and one that had been falsified. The Armenians in 1915 did not exist, neither the Kurds did not exist in that history. 
Delsim of 1938 did not exist, neither did the alibis. The 1930s pogroms of trades targeting the, targeting the Jews did not exist, neither did the truth behind the wealth, wealth text Warlick Vergis on 1940s or the pogrom of 6th and 7th of September of the 19, 1950s. They all did not exist in our official history. When I graduated from the Faculty of All Political Science in Ankara in 1965, I was a 21-year-old Turkish youth un unaware, unaware of these issues or the real dimensions of our history. In short, our infamous pages do not find a place in our history. History has been falsified to such an extent that even Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the founder of the Republic, has been censored. For instance, on 24th of April 1920, Mustafa Kemal, in his first speech from the floor of the parliament, evokes 1950s and says, disgraceful deeds ignominy. These words cannot be found in our official history. They have been covered up like so many others. This official history does not trust its own people. It aspires to keep its citizens in the dark and make them live in a world of lies. Or in other words, the state does not permit anyone to step outside its incantations. It is for this reason that an alternative historiography was difficult to create and terrible late in the coming. The Republican nationalist ideologues, never for, for a moment neglecting their talk about enlightenment, shackled critical thinking, which is the essence of a democratic way of life. That is why in Turkey, coming to grips with history is coming to grips with the present, not with yesterday, but today. It may also be put this way, tackling history in Turkey, dealing with history in Turkey is a political fight. When one starts to touch history beyond the red lines, one comes face to face with today's problems and their causes. On the Armenian question and 1915, on the Kurdish question, on the Alawite question, on the military question, when you start to look into the real history, when you start to touch the, into the truth itself, you hear this shriek voice crying out, stop. You receive messages of warning that tell you that you have crossed into uncanny, very risky territory, for it is the invented form of history that suits their purposes. They, um, I mean, they, they told police. The told police are even to this day in action, wielding their sticks, are ever ready to punish whose those who do not think in their own mold. George Orwell once said, freedom is the possibility of telling people what they do not wish to hear. The idea would drive, the t this idea would drive the thought police crazy. For them, there exists but one single truth, and that is, the one they think they have monopolized. The same goes for history, which they believe they can monopolize. Yet one has to confront, yet one has to confront history. There is no other way. We need to question official history. It is not becoming for the civilized person to avoid confronting the ugly pages of history or questioning the cliches of the official history. 
For a country that wishes to adopt democracy as a way of life, one of the preconditions is not to have a single stone unturned in, the, in, the, in its path in order to attain peace and democracy. The more you confront history, the more you question history, the more mature is the country, the more at peace with itself is the society. I remember Ranting. It was by the lakeside in the Austrian Alps, near Salzburg, the spring of 2005. Dear Rand opened his heart to me, which was burning against many an injustice historical occurred. As always, he was sincere. He spoke in torrents of emotions, emotion. His heart knew no breaks. The democratization of Turkey was our common goal with Rand. He believed that Turkey headed for the European Union what would develop and democratize and thus relax, achieving in the end the self-confidence and maturity necessary for surpassing nationalism in time and settling accounts with its own problem and history. Said Rand Dink, in 1923, when, when the Republic was founded, there was 300,000 Armenians living in Turkey. At the time, the population of Turkey was 13 million. Today, this has gone up to 70 million, but the Armenians are now 60,000. Why are we reducing numbers while Turkey's population has risen? Unquote. Dear Hrant was organizing, quote, there is not a single textbook that presents the different cultures that exist in Turkey. There is not one single sentence in the textbooks for the Turkish language course that says, alongside the sentence, Ali throw ball to, the, to Aisha, something like Ali throw ball to Hagop. That alone, <clears throat> an entire textbook. Nine years have gone by, no, seven, I think. Still no such sentence in our textbooks. We still disregard the roots and traces of the Armenians in Anatolia. Ranting knew from within his life the fear of truth that the state imposed in Turkey. His anguish was his guide. And he knew, Hrant knew that in touching history, he was playing with fire. He knew how sinister, how dangerous a task it was in this country to touch upon history, to refuse living in lies, to emancipate the mind. But he was determined. He was aware that without turning the stones, you could not get anywhere. He was very much aware that as minds became emancipated, the pains of the past would not be experienced anymore, and that this land would be fed up with the tragedies and would finally open to peace. Dear Hran Ding paid a very high price. On the 19th of January 2007, he paid the ultimate price with his life. This terrible price was to step up, was to speed up the emancipation of captive minds in Turkey. 100,000 people marched at his funeral procession in Istanbul in January 2007. In, and in December 2008, 30,000 people signed a petition said, I share the emotions and the pain of my Armenian brothers and sisters and I apologize them. And in 2010, 24th of April, was commemorated for the first time in three different places, in Istanbul, and additionally in Ankara, Izmir, and Diyarbakir. In the 1990s, an alternative historiography has, had emerged and progressed rapidly, 
resulting in publication of works. And 1915 was no longer a taboo in academia. I personally went to Yerevan for the first time in 2008. And uh, I jotted my feelings down uh, at my colon, at Miliet. Hrant Dink once said, come, let us pay respect to each other's sufferings. It was perhaps these words of our dear Hrant and the pain he experienced that brought me for the first time to Armenia and flung me one morning at, down in, into a torrent of emotions in front of the genocide memorial. Mount Ararat appears one moment to disappear the next moment behind the mist. It looks sad, how noble, how graceful it looks with its peak under the snow. You can almost touch it as it were if you reach out, it, it feels so near. Alone with Herant, I delve into contemplation in front of the memorial, thinking about paying respect to sufferings, understanding other sufferings, pain, and sharing their anguish. Alone with Herant in the strange silence of, morn of the morning, you cannot escape history. In the silence of, morning, of the morning, I realize once again the insignificance of denying history, but at the same time, what risks are run if one becomes captive of history and the anguish? And also the idea that roots are never lost. The roots of people and the territories where they have taken root are very important. In the same way, as depriving people of their mother tongue and their identity is a great crime against humanity. So it is with tearing people away from their territory. Adding an excuse to this, adding an excuse to all these is an indispensable part of this crime. And Armenians experience that great suffering. They experienced this when they were in, when they were torn away from Anatolia in 1915-1916, and never was the yearning in their heart for Anatolia quenched. Dear Hrant's voice rings in my ears. Come, let us first pay respect to each other's suffering. And Hrant thinks ask, asks. Quote, are we going to act like those responsible for the great catastrophe of the past, or are we going to write in the new pages this time in a manner that befits the civilized person, civilized human being by drawing lessons from these mistakes? Is that not right, dear Hrant? You used to say, neither admission nor denial but comprehension. As you knew perfectly well that the road to comprehension passes through democracy and regime of freedoms. Dear brother, dear friend, the sun is rising in Yerevan. It is like a crimson orange in the mist. Is in this beautiful silence of the morning. I lay the white carnations at the pedestal of the memorial for you. For what brought me here was you and your suffering. The end of the quote for my article on ranting at that time. The suffering of the 1915 does not belong to the past, but to the present. Only by coming to terms with history, but not a kind of invented or falsified history like ours, real history, and by saving history from the scorch of abuse, can we, at it, can we attain quietude and achieve the real and lasting peace. Peace and democracy, alas, always come true in suffering and in return for 
the payment of a high price. It is not possible for humanity to grasp the rope of peace and tranquility without the, all, without the disappearance of all kinds of nationalisms. As a result of the horrible price that our dear Hrant paid with his life seven years ago, finally my mind broke the chain of captivity, are there to say. I have a question for you I would like to ask. Have you ever considered what shape self-inflicted self -inflicted violence might take place? Have you ever considered what shape self-inflicted violence might take place? Have you ever felt the pain caused by self-inflicted violence when you try to shift some stones when you try to touch upon certain taboos. I think I felt this violence within me in March 2011, as I told you at the beginning of my speech, while I prepared for my speech in Los Angeles. I struggled with the word genocide at that time. This is what Nilüfer Göle, a well-known Turkish sociologist and a writer, has to say in one of her books. They will get angry with you when you begin to shift about the foundation, when you begin to shift about the foundation stones and steer things up. You have to never tired of them being angry with you. Self-inflicted violence is part of being an intellectual. Not only without, but also within, you must constantly move around the foundation stores, stones and steer things up. You must betray yourself if you want to be a true intellectual. This is the kind of a painful, difficult, in the meantime, dangerous process that dear Hrant speed it up in Turkey with his tragic death. I remember Hrant think here once again, and I share his anguish, his pain caused by the genocide. Now, at the last, if you have still patience, I could read a short statement I prepared a very short statement, I preferred about what to be done, especially on the part of Turkish government for 2011. That's, a, that's, a, that's something, I mean, is a, a, my personal uh, thoughts on 2000 for, for the next year. The present Turkish Republic, Turkish state, one, the present Turkish Republic at least express her sorrow on the loss of life or sufferings of the Ottoman Anatolian Armenians and denounced the deportation order and what happened in 1915 as inhuman, at least the Turkish state should do this. I said at least, but in my opinion, Turkish Republic as a state should end the policy of denial of 1950 and next year apologize from the Armenians because of their sufferings of 1950. Secondly, Turkey can grant fast track citizenships to all Armenians who have fled from deportation and settled in other countries. Third, for those Armenians who wish to return to their ancestral country and resettled in Turkey, a financial assistance package could be activated. Fourth, 
efforts to normalize relations between Turkey and Armenian Republic by establishing diplomatic relations and opening the border should be reactivated without preconditions. Both sides should start contribute to open more uh, real to open more real channels of dialogue between civil societies of the two countries and diaspora. And as to the assassination of Ranting, the real murders and the gang within the state, within the deep state, still in the dark, should be brought to the light in the name of or sake of peace and democracy and the rule of law, thank you. Uh, rule of law in Turkey. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Rafi. Uh, Rafi is uh, putting too much of uh, responsibility on my shoulders to project what's going to happen from now on and where, where we go from here. That was not my understanding, but uh, I let me explain what I feel my job is here. Uh, I was invited to be as Dorian Institute representative, one of them, to um, summarize the, team, the themes that Sir Jamal has discussed about, do some critique of it, if, if possible, and raise some questions. First, I wish to thank the organizations, the Armenian Association of Toronto, AGBU, and Bolsa High Cultural Association, particularly two individuals, one of them sitting on my right, Mr. Rafi, I mean Petrosian, sorry, and Mr. Alam Mishnar, who have conceptualized this evening and with the help of these organizations made it possible. Thank you. I would like to thank you, my dear Kardashian <laughs> Hassan Bey, for making this long trip to Toronto to share with us your personal journey to enlightenment from a captive Kemalist nationalist mind to a free emancipated mind, having granting your friend as a catalyst for that transformation. It is a real privilege to be here to reflect and share with you and the audience, my, our understanding to the full substance and significance of what our esteemed speaker read and what we can make out of it. I tried very hard to follow his reading, but I'm gonna try to categorize this into four distinct areas that he covered uh, as, a, as the main theme of his reading. The first was the word genocide, evading the use of the word genocide. And as we saw, he gave details about his psychological, his emotional journey and his transformation in the past, particularly 10 years, and his various uh, experience with Tehran in Europe, in Turkey, then Yerevan, and Los Angeles. Uh, his uh, internal struggle with the, on one side, uh, his close friend, killed in Los Angeles. On the other side, his best friend, Haran Pink, and his influence on him. So it's, it was an honest and uh, candid expression of his transformation. <clears throat> the second theme of his speech was the influence of Haran Dink as not only as an Armenian, 
but particularly what Rand represented in Turkey and his influence in changing that mindset, that captive mindset of not only Hasan Jamal but several other Turkish scholars and intellectuals that through Hrant's description of how to approach that taboo, the main taboo of genocide word, or the even touching the history as he put it in a moment ago, he dealt with Hrant's influence, actions, and the impact on the Turkish society. And not only on Turkish society, but at large on us as Armenian society as well, because we had misunderstanding and misinterpretation of Iran's uh, discussions, even in this hall some years ago. The third major theme he discussed is history. What is the impact of history? And what does history do within Turkey itself? And in our case, of course, between Turkey and Armenia. Imagine 1915, there were no Turks, no Armenians. Imagine there were no Alevis. There were no other minorities, no genocide of Armenians, no death scene massacres, etc. And what was the meaning of, or the challenge of scholars and intellectuals to deal with that history? That's where I feel connected not as only human being, but as a Zorian Institute member, one of the founders of this institute, that history is an assembling block if it is not truth, truthfully dealt with, between people within Turkey, Kurds, Turks, Armenians, etc., but more particularly between two nations, Armenians and Turkish. Yes, we have come a long way in the last 10 years in dealing sort of semi-openly, at least at the academic level, at the intellectual level, about dealing with the truth about history. But history has been a stumbling block for a long time between Turkey and Armenia. It continues to be because of the state narrative that is forced on society at large in Turkey, and even today, that has not changed. So these are the main topics that he dealt with. And of course, his belief that unless that history is corrected, unless the narrative of that history is presented truthfully, there will be no peace, no reconciliation between these two people. So our role, not to perpetuate that hatred, but our role is to dig out the truth and make it accessible to the Turkish society as well as civil society in Armenia, so that we understand each other from a different perspective. And in order to do that, we need to create and develop what is called common body of knowledge, a history that is incontestable, undeniable, whether by a Turk or an Armenian. Of course, the challenge being how we go about it, and how we go, how we develop that it is detached, it is not emotional, it is scientific, and it is based on actual historical truth.
these are the themes that I felt that you talked about, basically. Yes, you summarized very well. I have to deal with the word genocide, my dear Hassan friend. The, I agree with you it, in the words of uh, Haranting, whether it's massacre, whether it's slaughter, whether it's uh, deportation, but at the end of the day, as you said it, uh, if the most vulnerable of the society is slaughtered, without due respect to the children, women, elderly, and uprooted from their three to four thousand years of historical homeland, what difference does it make to use that word? Who cares? As long as we can get to the bottom of this truth, who cares? Well, here is where there is a problem, and we need to find ways and means of resolving this. The, the word genocide is a major dilemma for both uh, groups, both people, because it has both political and legal meaning. And uh, I can't go, I can't take your time because Rafi is already kicking me, saying the time is very short. Uh, it, I'm going to give you two examples of how political and how uh, legal issues are there, and the political is because it can be like an earthquake in Turkey, shaking the foundations of the republic. Legal because under the convention, that presumes certain responsibility and obligation on the perpetrator state and its successor. These are the main obstacles of the use of this word. And the challenge for us, for you and for me and for people like us that deal with history, is how do we find a way that we bring the Turkish society and eventually the state to come around and be able to use that word with the same comfort, the same evolution of the mindset that you went through. Is the question? The Turkish civil society, if it's exposed to the true facts and the opportunity to give them, to, to make it possible for them to to know about the truth, to know about this history, is the only way that I can see that we have a chance about the usage of that word. Last but not least, if you allow me two more minutes. Mr. Hassan Jamal, you're not the first Turkish scholar, thinker, that is facing this community. Journalist. Prefer. We have had many Turkish scholars come in. My personal encounter started in 1984 with Yulmaz Gunay, when he, without hesitation, in Paris, declared that what happened to Armenians was nothing but genocide. Since then, we've seen, we've heard from Khalil Bektay, Tani Rakcham, Rajiv Zarekhoğlu, Fethiye Çatin, Shafak, and the list goes on. The significance here is Hassan Jamal. <laughs> Hassan Jamal and his background. Someone whose grandfather is still a hero in Turkey. Someone who conceptualized I mean, your grandfather is one of the triumvirs who conceptualized the nationalist Turkey, whose name are on one you can one can find on the streets 
on mosques, and so on and so forth. So, unfortunately, you were burdened twice. You burdened more than any Turkish intellectual to be the agent of change of that mindset. And to do this, I think, I repeat myself one more time, that the only way we'll get there if we have that common body of knowledge of history that we'll share together. I leave this, I leave this my uh, analysis of your speech with a question to you. That you be are, a difficult one. You are free to answer now, or you can answer in one of your writings. Yeah. You know, you were suggesting, first before the question, you were suggesting a few I, uh, steps that Turkish government to do this and that and let the Armenians come in, give them citizenship, etc., etc. I have some 26 taboos. You know taboo is? Tabu. 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 The deeds. Yes, deeds. You did not mention anything about me coming and being able to get those lands and homes in Urfa that we have. And basically, maybe that blonde lady that met you in uh, New Jersey, New Jersey. Maybe you can come and claim your house, you never know. It's already sold. Oh, I sold it? Okay. 1920. <laughs> so the question that I'm going to live with you is this. You are born in a lucky, under a lucky star. And that lucky star, unfortunately, is deeming now for the nationalists because you have now freedom your, your mind is emancipated. But at one time, you would have been considered as one of the ruling class of this, of your nation, one of the descendants of ruling class of your nation. If today, Mr. Erdogan sees a, gets a wisdom from heaven or whatever, and comes and asks you this question, Hasan Jama, you are in charge of organizing the centennial that these Armenians are going to be celebrating or commemorating in a couple next, of, I mean, one year, I guess. Next year. Next year. So how would you go about planning such an event? I know it's a tall question, <laughs> but I leave this with you. Thank you. The politicians or the political leaders, when they confronted such questions, they start answering, I do not answer hypothetical questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to evade the question. I mean, it's the, the first thing is to start, to start with an absolute or first grade rule of law and the freedom of expression, the first step. And the second step, uh, to start with, without any precondition, to open up the borders with Armenia and start the full diplomatic relationship with Armenia. And in the meantime, uh, to uh, remove all the stumbling blocks uh, between uh, the real dialogue channels on civil society level at the university level. I mean, try to open up uh, the hearts and minds of the two people. That is the most important part. For instance, uh, in my previous, some of my 
articles, or maybe in my book too, I put one thing that Hrant Ting, I said, open up the lock of my heart and the Taner Aksham, open up my lock of my mind. That is very important. We have to start communicating with each other. We, we, we have to free our captive minds because the captive mind issue or, or a problem is not only something with the Turks. I think Armenians have a problem of captive mind too. We have to open up, emancipate our captive minds in both sides. I know that there are prejudices on both sides. Still, I understand the reasons, especially, of course, on the Armenian side. I know the wall of mistrust, especially the the high wall of mistrust towards the Turkish state, that the Turkish state would change or started giving the indications of a change or not. For instance, in last October in New Jersey, I just finished my speech Something like that, the same speech in the general context. Uh, a gentleman came over to me and took me to the side and asked me, Mr. Jamal, are you an agent of the Turkish state? I was surprised a little bit, but I understand the question. And he continued, if I were not, how I would dare to write a book named Armenian Genocide? And then the final analysis, I said, look, a state agent in Turkey start writing books, the name Armenian Genocide, Something is changing in Turkey too, don't you think so? Now, of course, this skeptical, uh, skepticism towards the Turkish state is very understandable. And there are reasons coming from the very suffering, very painful past. But still, you and the Armenian diaspora should pay much more attention what is going on at the social level in Turkey. I'm not talking about the state level. Because you don't have to focus only the state. Much have changed in the Turkish society and in Turkey at a public level, especially after the loss of our dear friend Link. And for this reason, answering your question, first of all, I would start have a very free, very lively uh, communicate, communication and exchange of with on, on a social society level. That is the number one uh, priority. And uh, in order to achieve that, of course, I have to change the mindset of the state. And the, for instance, at once to find the real uh, uh, murderers of what I'm thinking. And, uh, to take them from the dark and uh, to have 
realize the justice on that. And the, as I said, uh, the opening of the borders and the full, democ full diplomatic relationship. I'm not going to in detail, but the end, of course, Turkish state should apologize, not necessarily using the word of genocide, but should apologize from all Armenians what happened in 1950. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.